Hey there, this is Matt at State of Flex here with a review for Salem's Lot, both book and the film. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a copy of the film anymore. Uh, I opted to get rid of it. However, that's not reflective of my thoughts of the film. I was just kind of condensing my uh, inventory. Salem's Lot, I'm going to start with the movie, is pretty good. As a standalone feature film, having not read the book, as a made-for-TV movie especially, it's pretty darn spooky noochies. Uh, it has one of the best jump scares of the 70s in general. Uh, something I really quite appreciated when watching it. And it has great set designs and a villain that looks just so evocative of Nosferatu brought to a then-modern aesthetic surrounding. And made this vampire story really murky and gruesome and scary for a made-for-TV audience, written by the same guy who wrote Carrie, the film, not Stephen King, who also wrote Carrie. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good movie, directed very well, uh, so incredibly competent, competently well by Toby Ho Hooper. If Toby Hooper had not helmed this film, I don't think it would have landed certainly the scares or the chill factor that it has. He has a really good and interesting way of photographing things that work well. And I, uh, I really appreciated the movie. Its biggest downfall is, if you've read the book, it deviates in some key parts that really kind of criminally ruin the film as an adaptation. But if you've not read Salem's Lot, I urge you to watch it. It is one of the best TV horror films, best TV movies in general that you will ever watch. It is that damn good. And I'm talking like network television made for TV era. Like now there's things that go streaming to Netflix. Um, that doesn't count. But Salem's Lot is pretty, pretty good when it comes to that. And a lot of the best made-for-TV movies that I have seen have been adaptations of King's works. And that says something both about how people connect with his books and how the horror unfolds. The horror doesn't come from the gruesome so much. It comes from a human response to certain aspects of society or dangers that, and fears that we all have. And I'll touch on that shortly. But if you've not seen Salem's Lot, the feature film, it is a three-star, very solid piece of work, and I urge you to watch it. But I want to talk to you about the book. I'd seen Salem's Lot, but I'd never read the book. And then in 2019, October of 2019, I did read the book, and it kick-started my interest in reading every single one of Stephen King's work on a low level. I finished this book, I loved it, and I was like, what else he got? And I went to the uh, bookstore and I saw Carrie sitting there and I was like, well that was his first book, might as well read that. And I already talked to you last week on how I responded to that. But it was really because I'd read this book that I'd gave, uh, given Carrie a chance that day, that formative day. Um, Salem's Lot is great. It is a phenomenal update of Dracula, set in a suburban sprawl that pretty much anybody reading a paperback novel would be able to relate to. Um, and the thing that I really liked about it was the villain. Barlow is such a good modern reinterpretation of Dracula. Now, I complained about Barlow, as well as praised Barlow, in the feature film. Barlow in the feature film is a modern adaptation of Nosferatu. He's a voiceless monster that looks demonic and horrible, and really, quite honestly, I'll just show you, that is Barlow in the movie. Like, straight up, it just looks like Nosferatu. But if you've ever read Dracula, Dracula is kind of a romantic figure. He is likable. There's something that just clings to him, yet he's sinister. 
and he is scary, as is Barlow. Barlow just felt like he was a reinterpretation of Dracula plucked from the 200-year-old novel and plopped into this spectacular work. And then you had a really good and interesting main character in Ben Mears. Not as interesting as Carrie was, but I liked Ben Mears quite a bit. And this is the, gonna be the first in a very, very long line of self-posit characters for Stephen King. This is a guy who comes back to his hometown as an author and wants to start penciling a book and he's talking about this gorgeous house. And you think in the beginning that the story is going to, the horror of the story is going to come from the house, a la uh, Hell House or um, A Haunting on Hill House, that kind of thing. It doesn't. I mean, it does to some extent. It becomes a story of vampirism, which unfolds gently as the story is told. And the thing that I like is that it preys on fear, not of vampirism, but of the idea that maybe you don't actually know your neighbors as well as you think you do. They could turn on a dime in, at any moment, and uh, it, this is something that was very common in like the slasher horror that would emerge in the 70s when this book uh, was written and eventually grew to very strong popularity of the whole idea of the suburban horror that our neighbors may hold dark secrets within the walls of their house. But it also touches on another thing, which is the vampirism in this isn't traditional vampirism. It acts much more like a Romero zombie. It's like a disease that is sweeping through. and. Reading this right before COVID uh, was kind of an interesting thing because, uh, like, you have very prominent at the start of your or at the front of your mind of uh, uh, I read it in October of 2019. Uh, you're hearing about this virus that is slowly taking over uh, a country, then a continent, then multiple continents, and then it becomes a pandemic, and then it becomes something that has had lingering effects to us on this very day. Um, and so, like, it touches on the whole idea of what happens if illness grows out of control? What if you can't stop it? Maybe the only answer is to burn it all down. And I will say, I liked the ending of this book, but I understand why you change that ending for the movie. Because it's not cinematic ending. It's it's not really an ending. It's an ellipsis that never really gets completed. I haven't read the Dark Tower books yet, so my understanding is that one of these characters that survives, and I'm not going to spoil that, will show up later on in one of the Dark Tower books. I want to say it's the fourth one. Maybe it's the fifth one. Maybe it's the sixth one. Maybe it's all of them. I don't know. Uh, but I, I have understanding that King's works are all largely very interconnected, and this is one of the stories that has very strong lingering effects later. Um, but Salem's Lot is an extraordinarily good book, good read, um, and it goes there at times. There's some great stuff with a kid, and you like when people start dying. He even the unlikable characters have like strong import in your brain as you're reading them, so when they start dying off even, it's, it takes a hold of you, and it's, it's well written uh, to the max. A lot of people have this book as one of like their top five favorite Stephen King books. As of now, I would agree, I would put it at number two of the books that I have read um, uh, recently in my reread re of uh, a lot of his works. Again, I've only read about 20 of his books so far, but um, I have Salem's Lot in the number two slot. It is a great, great book. And in that same way that Carrie was, it's a page turner. You don't want to put it down. You want to know where it goes. And what was wild was I'd seen the movie, but this, unlike Carrie, was so, so different than the movie adaptation because of that Barlow character 
who has character. He speaks, he has thought, uh, he has motivation. Uh, and you don't necessarily get that from the standard scary movie horror that Salem's Lot, the feature film, delivers to you. Now, it's my understanding that there is a filmed feature film for Salem's Lot, a theatrical release, that uh, was scheduled to hit theaters in, I think, 2020, got pushed to 2021, has been pushed to 2022, 2023, and, like, Warner Brothers is just sitting on this. You can go to Barnes & Noble right now and buy the book from, like, two or three years ago with the poster for that movie on it saying, coming soon. Um, when we'll see this movie, when it'll get the light of day, I'm not sure, but I'm excited to see it because I want to see a true, authentic interpretation of Barlow. And yes, I understand there was a mini-series uh, on, I want to say TNT, uh, it could have been Sci-Fi or USA or one of those things, from uh, the early 2000s that did a more authentic adaptation of Salem's Lot, but I also hear it's not very good. Uh, I haven't seen it. Had a pretty solid cast, I will admit. Um, but I, uh, I haven't watched it. I, I was kind of waiting to see what this Warner Brothers feature had to offer. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't get a tax write-off. Um, and if it does, the Zaslav sucks. Um, but if it does hit a theatrical launch, uh, which I hope it does, hopefully next year, maybe October. It was supposed to come out this October after being supposed to be out last October, at the very least. I know this for sure because we had it slated at my theater. Um, but uh, I digress. Salem's Lot, the book, is an easy four-star book. The movie is a good time, three-star movie. And if you haven't seen uh, the uh, movie, I urge you to watch it. It's a good time, but if you have read the book, you might be disappointed with what that movie is, and if you've not read the book, I think you'll really like it. Um, and just, in general, read Salem's Lot. It's so good. Um, I'll hit you sometime next week with a review for The Shining, um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to doing more of the Stephen King book film things. Uh, and if you see my light flickering, I don't know why that is. It's Spooky Noochies, because it's Spooky Noochie season. Um, thanks for watching, like, subscribe. I do apologize if that uh, it just occurred to me, if that lighting and flickering is going to create blur like it did in that one video that I had uh, uploaded a couple weeks ago. Big oops, big sorry. Uh, but gently massage that like button and subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Peace.